All right, we have our, our panelists here. Thank you for joining us for our second session on uh, exemplary figures and conversions. We're going to be talking uh, this morning. Um, uh, Alex Plato will be talking about the Franciscan tradition and John Henry Crosby about Dietrich von Hildebrand uh, and Rob McNamara about Adich Stein. So, are you ready, Alex? I think Almost. you're going first. Okay, well, we'll give, we'll give him a moment and give you all a moment to get situated. So. All right, ready enough. All right, ready enough is just fine. Take it Great. away. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me, John Henry. Um, I, I always love being on these panels. I've been watching quite a few panels on the live stream at home, so I haven't been here in person, but my beadboard project is progressing in my kitchen. So I get to listen to great things as I'm doing work. Um, so happy to be here. Um, I wanted to say that um, uh, when I pre started preparing for this, it's always, I always have this experience of there being too much to talk about. Um, so I want to try to limit myself to the, to the 10 minutes I was given, so I only have a couple things to say, and hopefully in the panel discussion a lot more will come up. Um, but I wanted to read just a little bit of an introduction and then read a few passages from some things and, uh, and then propose these for discussion. So um, what I want to propose is that St. Francis's conversion and his life of holiness inspired a massive proto-personalist movement, which covered the whole world, transformed art and culture, and philosophy and theology, and that it led to both religious and lay conversions of mass proportion, and according to von Hildebrand in his little book on St. Francis and the secular Franciscan order, previously called the Third Order of Penance, three religious orders and some 350 saints. But we must not forget one central point to begin these reflections. St. Francis did not set out to make a splash. He did not set out to form a movement to inspire the art and poetry of the likes of Giotto and Dante. He did not set out to inspire the massive cathedral of thought called these days the Franciscan intellectual tradition, what used to be called when it was more known and obviously a vital thing, the Franciscan school of thought. By the by, even though you might not know even though you might know little about the Franciscan school, which is greater and not equal to the widely known intellectual tradition or school of thought we call Thomism, I will return to some of its themes later in St. Bonaventure. So St. Francis, he did not set out to reform his society, which had obvious needs of reform, clearly cataloged in chapter two um, of Chesterton's masterful book on St. Francis of Assisi. Um, no, St. Francis didn't do anything. He didn't pursue a course of action, like a pagan seeking the best way. He did not pursue a line of thinking. He did not envision a spirituality and then try to live it. No, he fell in love and pursued his beloved, his Lord and Savior, his God and his all, our Lord and our God and our all. That's the central point that Chesterton, in his biography of St. Francis, and von Hildebrand in his little book on St. Francis, insists on. Although my topic in this panel is St. Francis, what I want to do is discuss Franciscan thought and spirituality more ge generally, as both a legacy of St. Francis's sainthood and as a way for us to think about conversion and the spiritual life. I am sorry to disappoint those who would like me to meditate on the incredible life and experiences of one of the greatest saints, but my excuse is that I'm not an expert, I'm not even a competent historian of St. Francis, I'm not myself a secular Franciscan in the Third Order of Penance, as von Hildebrand and many, many others were, um, I'm not a theologian, I'm literally a humble poor man in these areas of discourse. But what I am is an ardent lover of the living and vital Franciscan school as it exists today through my personal devotion and love of St. Bonaventure and Blessed John Duns Scotus and my sometime study of their work, which I routinely teach here at Franciscan. I say Franciscanism is a living and vital tradition of thought, although many don't know of it. But I learned this tradition in one of its most important and fruitful streams today, for I learned it alongside other Franciscan friars in a course taught by my dear friend, Dr. Jared Goff, who was a protege of the saintly and great 20th century theologian, Peter Damien Fellner. Fellner, who I may have time to briefly discuss below, and his protege, Dr. Goff, have done the great tradition of St. Francis a tremendous service, for they have kept alive the authentic tradition and are teaching it to friars, other scholars, and are contributing important research in history, theology, and philosophy. This Franciscan tradition of thought is a living school, just as Thomism is a living school, or the Communio school is. Its roots are the conversion and the life of St. Francis, the little poor man. And its three pillars of thought, I might say, are St. Francis himself as a theological datum. So in this case, it contrasts with the Dominican tradition where St. Dominic isn't himself a datum of theology. Um, and I'll get to this point in a, mo in a moment. So the first pillar is St. Francis himself, his live personality and lived experience. 
and then the second pillar is St. Bonaventure, the seraphic doctor, and the third one is Blessed John Duns Scotus, known probably more widely as the subtle doctor, but whose other title is equally fitting and more important, I think, for us, the Marian doctor. These three pillars form the core of a complete cathedral of thought and spirituality, covering all the topics in philosophy and theology, and also instruct us on living and, and how, on a living and practicable spirituality. So what I want to do is um, just say briefly something about von Hildebrand, although John Henry will pick up more on von Hildebrand. He was um, greatly inspired by St. Francis. Obviously, he wrote this book, but I just wanted to read this, this short quotation from the foreword to this 1963 book by Alice von Hildebrand. She says this, this book written on the occasion of the 700th anniversary of the foundation of the third order of St. Francis is a song of gratitude. Indeed, the debt of my late husband to the Pavarella, the little poor man of Assisi, was a great one, for God used this saint to reveal to him the beauty of the supernatural. Later on, she just says this, that this discovery of St. Francis took place when Max Scheller spoke to von Hildebrand about the phenomenon of sanctity, which blossoms so frequently in the garden of the Catholic Church. To illustrate his thesis, Scheller sketched the personality of St. Francis using his outstanding philosophical gifts to open to his friend the kingdom of the supernatural, for every saint is a mini Tabor. So I want to discuss now um, Bonaventure. So Bonaventure was the seventh minister general um, of the Franciscan order. He was the sort of um, first transposer of St. Francis's life and spirituality into an academic key. So um, I teach a class on Bonaventure's texts. I love Bonaventure. Um, uh, he's a special um, saint that I'm devoted to. But I wanted to read just a little bit from his um, Triple Way, which is his um, Manual of Spiritual Theology, and then from his work called The Journey of the Mind to God, or the Itinerarium. So what I want to do is start with the, the triple way, because this is the sort of Franciscan summa, right, of mystical theology. Um, but it has even a wider significance than just for the Franciscans. So I want to read just a little bit from the beginning of this introduction to the triple way, which was written by the aforementioned Peter Fellner. So... Um, he says this, the triple way by St. Bonaventure is relatively unknown today in the English-speaking world, modern translations being non-existent in English until a few years ago. This is sad for its importance in and influence on Christian spirituality is especially great even today and cannot be underestimated. It treats the whole of mystical theology in a nutshell. It's a kind of breviloquium of mystical rather than scholastic theology, a summa mystica. He says this later on, he says that um, the triple way is the summa of spiritual theology. This fact explains why Pope Pius XI in his letter, Unigenitus Dei Filius, recommended it so highly for reading and meditation. Um, and he goes through and talks about its influence on many other thinkers, right, um, in the past. So he goes through a whole litany of those, which include Thomas Akempis, um, Ignatius of Loyola, um, St. Francis de Sales, and many others. So these had, a, had uh, were directly influenced by Bonaventure's Triple Way. Um, so what I want to do now is just say a couple things about the Triple Way and sort of um, read you a few portions from, from it. Now, before I do that, I want to say sort of what the Triple Way is. So the Triple Way is the way of pur purgation, illumination, and perfection. So it's three sort of steps through the path of holiness. And in each of those three ways, there's three modes, right? So there's there's meditation or study, prayer, and contemplation. So in each of the three modes, or sorry, each of the three ways, there's three modes that you can do in each of the three ways. So if you sort of imagine a matrix, right? Like make a tic-tac-toe board, right? You've got the three ways on the vertical columns and you've got the three modes in the horizontal columns. And Bonaventure uses that sort of schema, describes that and how any person can enter into the contemplative or spiritual formation path at different places is as an order and a, a way of doing it. And that's all described in this book. So in a nutshell, that's what he's doing. Um, but I wanted to just give you a taste of what he does by reading from the very first part of it, um, where he talks about, um, where he gives first the prologue and then he talks about the meditation in the purgative way. So you might think of that sort of like the upper left-hand corner of that tic-tac-toe board. Um, okay, so here's the prologue. Behold, I have described wisdom to thee in a threefold manner of ways in thoughts and knowledge, a quote from Proverbs. Since all knowledge, especially that taught by sacred scripture, bears the imprint of the Trinity, knowledge must be counted a special vestige of the Trinity. 
Hence, the wise man describes sacred doctrine in relation to its triple spiritual meaning, moral, allegorical, and anagogical. This threefold understanding is in response to the triple hierarchical action of purifying, enlightening, or illumination, and perfecting. Purification leads to peace, enlightenment to truth, perfection to charity. Once the soul has mastered these three activities, it enjoys bliss. Its merits increase to the degree it engages in their practice. On the knowledge of these three hierarchical actions, then, the entire understanding of sacred scripture and the merit of eternal life as well depend. Bear in mind that when he says the knowledge and understanding of sacred scripture, that was the classical definition of theology itself. So all of theology depends on this, is what he's saying. Um, there is consequently a threefold manner of exercising each of these ways, what I called the modes earlier, reading or meditating one, praying, and then contemplating. So here's from chapter one, just a taste of what he has us do. He says, let's first examine the former structure of meditation. Our active exercise of meditation in the three ways is conditioned by the degree to which we make fruitful use during meditation of the three powers within us, the sting of conscience, the light of reason, and the spark of wisdom. If your objective is cleansing, turn your attention to the sting of conscience. If the goal is enlightenment, turn your attention to the ray of light. If it is perfection, turn your attention to the embers of wisdom, as blessed Dennis the pseudo Areopagite counsels Timothy when he says, turn to the light. Here's the purgative way. As to the sting of conscience, you must exercise it by prodding first, then sharpening, and finally, by redirecting your conscience to the good. As you can see, Bonaventure loves uh, threes. Uh, <laughs> there's more of them, trust me, and many layers of them. Prodding is realized by recalling your sins. Sharpening is achieved by assessing your present state and right formation of conscience by making the good subject of your meditation, by making good the subject of your meditation. Here's the recollection of sin or examination of conscience. It must be conducted, he says, so as to acknowledge your many sins of negligence, concupiscence, and iniquity or malice, three things. Nearly all our sins and defects, whether actual or habitual, are reducible to one of these three. As regards negligence, now he has three things, okay. You should first examine whether you have been careless in guarding your heart, in using your time well, and in tending your life's true goal. So the first of the three has three points. <laughs> For you should expend maximal diligence in guarding your heart, in not wasting time, and in motivating every activity with a right intention. How many of us, right, could do an examination of conscience every day and be guilty of those, right? But if we memorized these and we did that every day, we would be so sensitive, right, to the Lord's calling and work in our hearts. That's just the first one. Second, you should examine whether you've been negligent in prayer, in reading, and in the performance of good works. For whoever wishes to bring forth fruit in due season must exercise and cultivate each of these with maximal diligence, because one without the others is absolutely insufficient. So the first one you can see um, corresponds to the first part of our soul, memory. And I think that Mark in his talk talked about the three parts of the soul from St. Augustine, where you have memory, intellect, and will. So the classical understanding of the human soul is those three powers, which are formally distinct, right, but united in the one activity of the soul. So the first one about negligence has to do with reforming your memory, right, your, your basic power of being conscious, right, of reality. And the second one has to do with intellect, right, and the third one has to do with your will. So he says this. Third, you must recall whether you have been careless in repenting and doing penance, in resisting temptation, and in progressing in holiness. For as diligently as possible, each of us must deplore the sins he has committed, repel the devil's temptations, and advance from virtue to virtue so as to reach the promised land. That's just one little taste, right, of, as I said in that sort of tic-tac-toe board, right, the upper left-hand column in the first mode, right, in the first part of the first mode. Right, so it's a very memorizable thing with lots of patterns, right? And as you can see, if we went, we'd go through that whole thing in detail, right, we would have a deep understanding of how to practice the spiritual life, how to go through conversion in the Franciscan way, right? Um, and I, I want to say that this book, in a certain way, the Triple Way, is an outworking or a practice, right, of a of a theory or a or a way of understanding the spiritual life that is cataloged in Bonaventure's famous work, The Journey of the Mind to God, especially Chapter Four. And since I'm nearly out of time, I just want to say a quick thing about this, the trip, the journey of the mind to God at Bonaventures. So um, uh, uh, we mentioned the, the, the last panel talked about Plato and the allegory of the cave, right, and Eros and the, the path of love. And so Bonaventure is the classical Franciscan expression of this journey of the mind to God, right? So it's a sort of, uh, 
uh, understanding of the sort of ideal path of understanding and growing closer to God through love. And, ch and it has seven chapters. And the fourth chapter is a turning point. So the first two chapters about how we can understand God through nature and art and external things, which Bonaventure calls vestiges, traces, or the footprints of God, the, the fingerprints of God, the clues. So all of creation, right, and this is obviously inspired by St. Francis's life, is semiotic. It has meaning. It has a message that it gives, right? So there's, a, there's an emphasis on beauty, art, culture, and nature in, this, in the first two steps of the of the journey. And then this, the third step, he says, let us enter into ourselves, right? See how much the soul loves itself, right? And how the intellect, right, then operates on that. And then the will fulfills that. And so you have the three functions of the soul in chapter three. Again, this is kind of from a philosophical point of view, but it's faith seeking understanding. And then the fourth chapter is that turning point I mentioned. And in that turning point, right, he talks about the process of what he calls hierarchization, that's Bonaventure's word for conversion in the life of the, the, the Christian soul is being literally drawn up, hierarchized, right, into the divine life, right? I just want to read a quick description of that, but that's the sort of theoretical understanding and philosophy and theology of what he describes in this triple way, right? So let me just describe that from Bonaventure, and then, then, I'll, then I'll stop there. Okay, so... And I believe Mark also mentioned from St. Augustine the spiritual senses tradition, so that is very much contemplated in this chapter of the spiritual senses. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read a little bit from this, okay. It says, since we contemplate the first principle not only by going through us, but also within us, and since this kind of consideration is more excellent than the former, the external vestiges, therefore it serves as the fourth step in contemplation. It seems strange indeed that after what has been shown of God's closeness to our souls, there are so few concerned about perceiving the first principle within themselves. Yet the explanation of this is immediately at hand. <clears throat> Distracted by many cares, the human mind does not enter into itself through the memory. But clouded by sense images, it does not come back to itself through the intelligence. And drawn away by the concupiscences, it does not return to itself the desire for interior sweetness and spiritual joy. Therefore, completely immersed in things of sense, the soul cannot re-enter into itself as the image of God. And just as when one has fallen, he must lie where he is unless someone join him and lend him a hand to raise him up. So our soul could not be perfectly lifted up out of these things of sense to see itself and the eternal truth in itself had not truth taking on human form in Christ become a ladder restoring the first ladder that had been broken in Adam. So here's the transition from sort of a natural reflection on our powers and on creation, right, to where God coming down to us is what's absolutely necessary for us to be hierarchized. Grace is necessary. It's impossible for us to do some sort of pagan thing where we contemplate the right things or learn the right things and we come back up to God. No, God has to come down to us. And that's the beauty of love, right, in the Christian tradition that, that Max Scheller so well states in his critique of Nietzsche, his book, right, that the Christian view is completely and utterly different than the pagan, right? Love, God is love and he comes down to us, right? We aren't just here competing to get up to God. Right? So it's a radically different view here, and Bonaventure mentions that. So he talks about the spiritual senses and how those are restored. Then he says this, when these things have been attained, our spirit is through faith, hope, and charity, sorry, um, and the spiritual senses are restored. When these things have been attained, our spirit is made hierarchical so that it may continue upward to the degree that it is in conformity with the heavenly Jerusalem. For into this heavenly Jerusalem, no one enters unless it first comes down into his heart by grace, as St. John beheld in the apocalypse. It comes down into our heart when by the reformation of the image, the theological virtues, the delights of the spiritual senses, the uplifting transports, our spirit becomes hierarchical, that it is purified, enlightened, and perfected, the triple way. Thus, our spirit is sealed with the nine degrees of orders when, it is, when its inner depths, the following, are arranged in proper order, announcing, dictating, guiding, ordering, strengthening, commanding, receiving, revealing, and anointing. And these correspond, each one of those we could contemplate on for a long time. Each one of these corresponds step by step to the nine orders of angels. In the human mind, the first three degrees of the aforementioned orders concern nature, the following three activity, and the last three grace. Having obtained these, the soul entering into itself enters into the celestial Jerusalem, where considering the order of angels, it sees in them God, who dwells in them and performs all their works. So you can imagine the soul is here and angels are at a kind of higher level in a certain way, but God reaches down 
hierarchizes ourselves all the way through the orders of angels to touching himself, right? And so that's Bonaventure's image. Now he goes into a lot more detail here, right? And there's a whole Franciscan tradition of understanding the will with its powers, which von Hildebrand picked up on some of those key themes in his works, right? The two affections of the will, right? The three orders of love, the three fundamental attitudes, all those I see in von Hildebrand's work as a sort of carrying on of the Franciscan intellectual tradition. So all that's behind this triple way, which I highly recommend to you all. Um, it's not long, even though this book looks that big, it has like half of this as an introduction by Peter Fellner, right? And then there's a Latin text, and then there's the triple way. So like a quarter of this is the actual English triple way, right? But it's a very cheap book and it has a lot of insights in it. Um, so I highly recommend that. And then Bonaventure's Journey of the Mind to God to see the sort of um, beautiful portrayal and picture of an entire theological metaphysical tradition of Franciscanism that then Scotus picks up in a more scholastic, academic, kind of disputed question way, right? And is a perfecter of Bonaventure's work as, as um, Paul VI and JP II himself called Scotus the perfecter of Bonaventure. So I'm gonna stop there. I think I went over 10 minutes, um, but um, there's lots to discuss uh, there. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope to hear what your questions are and hope to try to address those. Thank you, Alex. You're a, <clears throat> you're a river to your people. Um, and you know, it's too bad that Van Hildebrand didn't produce more books of this We're working less on intimidating it. size. Yeah. But this is yeah, that's pretty close. This is one of yeah. This the, that's true. There, for every 500 page book, there is maybe one of these. But uh, so I want to speak to you about um, Dietrich Van Hildebrand, the convert. And it seems fitting in the context of a seminar on conversion uh, to look at the man himself. And uh, I have to say, even when I first became aware of Dietrich von Hildebrand as a young man, I, I didn't always think of him as a convert. You know, he was such a, you know, he's sort of the, uh, the ultimate kind of Catholic, you know, so steeped in Catholic life and in culture. And uh, in some sense, uh, you know, taking on all the traits of a, of a cradle Catholic, but with the ardor of the convert. So it seems that it would be, I think, interesting to all of you to, uh, if we were to look at uh, some, of the, some of the stages of Van Hildebrand's conversion, and then I'd like at the end to extract by no means all, but some maybe key characteristics or key features of Dietrich Van Hildebrand's Christian vision uh, particularly the vision of the new creature in Christ, the, the person transformed by Christ. And then I'd like to, at the very end, I think I'll have time for this, just to read uh, to you all the prayer that concludes the book Transformation in Christ. The observation is often made that it's an incredibly rich and challenging and demanding book, um, and, and people struggle with it. That's why we only assigned five chapters of, of the book. Um, but it ends on this beautiful note, which is this prayer in which von Hildebrand prays that in a way everything that's been articulated in this journey of transformation be fulfilled in himself. He's, he prays in his own, in, in, in the first person, but of course he really, he prays on behalf of anyone going through this process. And I think it addresses some of the, uh, the hesitations people sometimes have with von Hildebrand articulating perhaps a particularly uh, idealistic or incredibly demanding uh, uh, path towards perfection. So, with regard to uh, Van Hildebrand himself, he's he's raised in a in a family of tremendous cultivation. His father was one of the most renowned sculptors and architects and painters of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, we're just in the process of dealing with all of Alice Van Hildebrand's possessions. Uh, we, we, we've received certain works by Adolf and Hildebrand, and I'm just in awe of the, 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 he, the son was prolific like the father, shall we say. I mean, there must be hundreds, if not over a thousand works that he produced in his lifetime. And the family, the family religion, one might say, though they were nominally Protestant, was a kind of high aesthetic vision. And so this is the context in which young Dietrich is raised, and he's deeply formed by the beauty of the home in Florence and then in Munich. Um, the, uh, it's interesting, Alice says in her, um, in her Soul of a Lion that he never met a Catholic until he meets Max Shaler later on, which is sort of a stunning 
um, observation to make for someone raised in, in Florence. But the entry into churches was always for the sake of the artistic and the cultural, never for the religious. And so he's, you know, his whole uh, relationship to the sacred, it, at least artistically, is under this aspect of, of art. But von Hildebrand says of himself, and we can observe it uh, in his, in also in his life, was uh, from the beginning uh, extraordinarily independent from the environment. Even this environment that was shaped by a dominant, the dominant personalities of his parents. He had five older sisters who were extraordinarily gifted and talented artistically and intellectually. Um, but from the very beginning, uh, what I what I've always been struck by is, is the. Uh, the independence from all of this influence, and at the same time, already a kind of sensitivity for the world of the supernatural, and also for the world of, of objective moral values. And, and uh, you know, th there's always the risks that some of these, uh, these stories that are often retold, they're told by von Hildebrand in his own memoirs, that they, they take on a cert certain hagiographical note. So one has to be careful how one how one tells them, but they're, they're striking nonetheless, and there's no reason really to doubt their veracity. So just, just to give you uh, a handful of examples, I mean, the, with respect to the, the, um, the world of the objectivity of moral values, the world of the, 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 world of the ethical realm, uh, he, ha, you know, the, the, the home was sort of liberal Protestantism, fundamentally relativistic, somewhat, um, his mother had certain Kantian influences, but basically it was a kind of relativistic environment. And you know, his sister announced to him one day that, of course, all moral values are relative, and he and he quarrelled with her, and she was surprised by the vociferous response that he gave. And she comes home and she appeals to her father, and she says, "Can you believe that that <laughs> young Dietrich doesn't accept the relative the relativity of all moral values?" And the father's comment was, "Well, he's only fourteen, after all." And the cheeky comeback from the son was, well, if that's your best argument, that's not much of an argument, father. <laughs> but, and, and there, there are many similar examples of this um, that, that demonstrate the independence, the recognition that there was, a, there was in fact a realm of, of morality that exceeds this, this, this um, you know, sort of relativistic, but, you know, with a lot of noble customs. You know, his parents would never have harmed anyone deliberately. They were very... Um, uh, there was a great gentility in them. The, the other thing that is very striking, though, and maybe more striking for his conversion was the, was the religious sensibilities that he had. And he describes, already at the age of four or five, having a kind of children's, an illustrated Bible. And I, I've never seen it, so I can't really speak to whether the, the art was particularly good or not, and he was only five. But nonetheless, um, he describes his fascination with reading these stories, and these were stories largely of the Old Testament, and he, he says that he could, he tasted the world of the supernatural, that the otherness of God was already somehow given to him in this. And this also extended then even to the, to the figure of Jesus himself, because in the family often it was, uh, must have been an unusual family, given that they were relativists and they still spent time talking about Jesus, but his mother apparently um, once said uh, that, well, Jesus, of course, is a, uh, is, is the son of God in the sense that all of us are children of God. And uh, his sister, who was eight at the time, repeated this to him, and he, at the age of five, said to her, he apparently stood on the back of his bed, and he pointed his finger at her, and he said, I swear to you that Christ is God. So you have this, uh, you have this, you have this extraordinary uh, awareness already as a young boy of a world that is much greater than the world that's been given to him. There's a world of good and evil, uh, God speaks to man in the stories of the Old Testament, and Jesus is not just a good man. Jesus is God. But on the other hand, this, this, this lay slumbering with him. But it's interesting that when he was baptized at the age of six, uh, this was done with a certain ironical spirit, and his sisters teased him. They called him the little priest in his little white gown, and he was very upset at this because he took it quite seriously. And so afterwards, when his mother asked him if he wanted to be confirmed as a teenager, he declined because he knew he wanted to be a Christian, but he wasn't convinced yet that the fullness of Christianity was found in this, this uh, sort of cultural Protestantism that he had been raised in, and so he declined in order to have that, that happen later. So the real impetus, as Alex said, for his conversion came uh, 
uh, when he became a university student and he meets the philosopher Max Scheler, who became one of his best friends for, from about 1907 until 1921 when there was a parting of the ways between the two of them. Um, uh, in fact, he says that he thinks that Scheler considered him his best friend. And this had to do with a whole host of reasons. But Scheler, in addition to introducing him to his own remarkable personality and to us, Shaler is, is, is the real source of, of von Hildebrandt's personalism, certainly more so than Husserl. Um, but Shaler also was the, 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 the person who, for the first time, introduced him to the face of the church, uh, making the, the, the somewhat stunning claim that the Catholic Church is the true church. Uh, and that was stunning because, again, at the, point, at the point in which von Hildebrand found himself, yet the idea of associating a church and its teachings with the truth was somehow a foreign concept still. And so Shaler produced this, uh, this sketch of St. Francis of Assisi, which is in the book by Shaler on uh, the, the problem of sympathy. And uh, I think the most significant thing that, that, it, that emerges in this sketch of the saint is the irreducibility of sanctity to natural virtue. The idea somehow that, um, that a saint isn't just an exceptionally moral individual and ex exhibiting primarily natural traits, but that there's a transformation of the saint uh, through the life of grace. And this, is, this was captured powerfully in Shaler's sketch for von Hildebrand, and that took him to the whole next level. And then Shaler inspired him to read, for example, he inspired him to read Muller's Symbolic, and uh, he also helped uh, Shaler later, of course, abandon the church, but at this point he was still a, a, a practicing Catholic, and he helped to dispel many of the latent, you know, sort of primitive stereotypes around Catholicism and opened him to Catholic teaching. And so this is, this is, you know, this is 1907, 1908, 1909. This is Van Hildebrand's early, uh, these are his years in the university. I won't go into it, but this is also the time in which he marries. In fact, he, um, uh, he and his wife-to-be, because they were not given the permission to marry by his parents that he needed as a young man, consummated their relationship, and then she was discovered one day she was pregnant. And even then, the parents refused. And uh, so he, um, and this, by the way, the, you, you'd be interested in this, that Adolf Reinach was sent as the emissary to his parents to try to persuade them uh, to let him marry, and even then it didn't materialize for some time. Um, but the, the, this time was a time of, of particular suffering for von Hildebrand because he felt that he was being put in a position in which, because his father still wanted to give him an out, from not, not to marry this, the mother of his child, that he was somehow showing a lack of commitment to someone that he loved and understood himself to have a lifelong commitment to. So this, this period of suffering is, is very important because we, we, again, we so often associate von Hildebrand with this extraordinarily um, ebullient and sunny uh, and, and vivacious personality, but he had a tremendous um, side for, he, he, like all of us, he, he had the capacity for and periods of real and profound suffering that, were, that, that shaped him immensely. And so finally, you know, the permission is given and he and his wife are able to marry and they name their son Franz in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. But during this time, 1913, his older sister surprises him by inviting him to come to her first communion in the catacombs of St. Cecilia in Rome. And he was completely surprised that this older sister, whom he described as proud and brilliant and she, striking personality, uh, had decided to become a Catholic. It was just not in her sort of aristocratic, aristocratic demeanor. So he accompanied her, and was, just, he describes in his memoirs how moved he was to see this proud sister of his kneeling to receive the Eucharist, a sort of a gesture he never expected her to do. And on their way home, to the sister, the sister in, at that time was living in Rome. Um, she, they shared a carriage together and she looked at him and she said, grace knocks at the door of the soul, but it may not knock again. Promise me you will take instruction when you return to Munich. And uh, this, this was sort of the, the nudge that he needed to finally make the move. Uh, and so he, began, he and his wife began to take instruction with a Franciscan priest in which they, um, you know, for the first time, studied their faith in a systematic way. And uh, they had to, I don't know if this is done today, but in, that, in, in those days, as Protestants, they had to go and renounce their Protestant faith, um, which had some, there were some humorous episodes there because they ended up in the wrong churches and so on and so forth. And they, um, uh, the, uh, the Protestant pastor was very upset at their, um, at their attempt to exit. And then finally, when he realized they weren't going to uh, 
remain Protestants. He said, well, I hope you'll be better Catholics than you were Protestants. <laughs> so then on Holy, Holy Saturday of 1914, he becomes, he's, uh, he's finally um, received into the church. They make their confession and their, 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 their reception. Then a month later, they were confirmed. And the, this, this, this is his, the moment of conversion is clearly the most significant moment in all of Dietrich von Hildebrand's life. It is, the begin, it is truly a vita nuova, as he himself would have said, uh, this, this, uh, this time in which he uh, could embrace his faith. He was such an ardent convert, by the way, that his spiritual director, uh, he asked his spiritual director, what should I do for Lent? And he, should, he said, you should stop talking about religion because he couldn't help himself. He just was constantly in evangelizing mode. Nowadays, we'd call him a missionary disciple, right? But at that time, apparently, um, he needed to be slowed down a little bit. But, but this, is, this, is the, this is really the, 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 the greatest moment of transformation in his life. The, the next seven years were spent um, in a further deepening of his life of faith. He spent all of his time in the, in the library in Munich reading uh, the fathers and doctors of the church. He had an extraordinary love for St. Augustine, and uh, he, he just couldn't have enough of this world of Christianity that he'd been inducted into. And in fact, he wrote nothing significant as a Catholic for about seven years, and then he wrote an essay called The New World of Christianity. And this is maybe a, a good segue to some of the, the what I would describe as some of the key features of Van Hildebrand's Christian conversion, which is, as I said before, this discovery of the supernatural. The idea that grace is not just, you know, some kind of new way of looking at the natural order, but that it, it really, um, it, in fact, in phenomenological terms, there are, um, for example, supernatural virtues that can be observed even by non-believers. So he thought that the virtue of purity, for example, was open for philosophical uh, exploration. But the essay is, an, is, is really quite an extraordinary thing to read because of the way in which he sees how grace transforms not only the life of the Christian, he thinks of the way in which it transformed the whole face of Europe, the way in which uh, the natural order is transformed. It's, 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 um, it, unfortunately, it's not yet in English, so we need to post haste and, and make this translation. But this, this, this world of grace, the world of the supernatural, which you see constantly in transformation in Christ is, I think, a, uh, a central preoccupation of Van Hildebrand. The uh, two other things I'll mention very briefly. Um, the other was the discovery of authority. Uh, during his, uh, his preparation for the church, so, so as you can imagine, a gifted young man like this um, tended to follow his own lead, right? Even, even in philosophical matters, uh, the, you know, his interests tended to dictate what he pursued. He speaks about this a lot as a kind of weakness in himself. But during their formation, the priest announced to them, you know, the church uh, does not permit artificial birth control, and you're going to have to follow that. And he was stunned by that. He didn't understand it. And the initial impulse was to refuse it. Um, but the priest said, either you accept everything, or you can't become a Catholic. This may be an unusual priest by, by today's standards, but not by Father James's standards. And, and so he... But he decided in that moment to accept this, even though he didn't fully understand it. And um, as, as he describes in his memoirs, he says, immediately in the period afterwards, he felt a kind of uh, illumination of the mind. He, he said he, had, he was filled with deep insights into the nature of love and into the meaning of human sexuality that he attributed to this acceptance of the authority of the church in faith and morals. And so that kind of docility um, in simultaneously present in a person of extraordinary intellect and independence um, never, never left him. And then the last thing I wanted to say, um, maybe, maybe, these, maybe these are two sides of the same point. Um, he wanted to be very clear, and he wrote an autobiography in the 70s, an intellectual autobiography, and he wanted to be very clear that, that his faith was not the, the source of his, or the principal source or inspiration for his uh, for his philosophical commitments. It was the other way around. He writes in one place, but my philosophical mindset was not determined by my faith. It was rather my philosophical mindset that paved the way for my reception into the church. And by that, he means this radical realism that he had from his realist phenomenological upbringing. This was something that he thinks uh, prepared him and opened him. So I think that's a very significant feature. And then the last related theme is simply... Uh, maybe one could call it Van Hildebrand's Christian humanism, but the way in which all of the natural values in which he'd been raised in this, this extraordinarily cultivated home were not set aside. 
They were, they were raised up and purified. You know, so this, the, for example, he, he, he remained no less interested in art and in music and so on. In fact, he was probably more sig significantly interested, especially because certain works opened up to him in new ways as he understood their sacred character. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think that's a, that's a very significant um, quality of von Hildebrand and There's probably not, I, I, I won't read this prayer simply, simply because we're out of time, but those of you who have transformation in Christ, on the very last page of the book, you'll find um, uh, this very beautiful prayer in which, as I said, everything that he proposes in this book as being constitutive of transformation in Christ is, is, is sought um, and asked for. And maybe the thing that always has struck me the most about this prayer is that the prayer doesn't just ask. It doesn't just say, transform me, O Lord. It's, it's a kind of credo as well. It says, I have faith in you, Lord, that you can do these things in me that I cannot do for myself. And so I, that's why I wanted to mention the prayer, because to the extent that he might describe, for example, surrender um, as seeming sort of easy or easier than it is for most of us. And as Matt Bruninger pointed out yesterday, there are so many obstacles to that. This prayer, I think, demonstrates a great realism about how much um, all of this is only possible uh, with, with the grace of God. Um, it's very touching, by the way, that on his tombstone in New Rochelle, the, uh, the words there are taken from scripture are the words of Peter, Lord, you know that I love you. And I think that that also captures the way in which as much as Dietrich von Hildebrand loved the Lord with all of his heart and soul, he knew that he had to, uh, he knew ultimately that, that even the love that he had for Jesus, Jesus was the guarantee of that, even when perhaps he were to fall short of that. Um, after all, Lord, you know that I love you even when I may not seem that I love you. And so I think that's um, vintage vintage Dietrich von Hildebrand, and it shows again how this very high vision of, of the Christian life is ultimately guaranteed and made possible by, by the grace of God. Can you please read that prayer? Just many viewers, maybe they don't have a reader or something later on. I would love if you could read that prayer. Well, it's you, it's, you right now? Sure. I mean, yeah, we can. We can, we can just read it at our closing dinner. Later. I, I think have, we should finish our yeah, presentation first. I have first people that I want to yeah. see this later. Yeah, no, that'll be, that'll be great. But Rob presently has negative two minutes uh, for, <laughs> for, for his presentation. I don't know how he's going to do it. Uh, but let's, let's turn to Rob first. And maybe perhaps that would be a good question for someone in the audience for the Q&A to ask John Henry to read the prayer <laughs> during our, during our Q&A. How about that? So. What we hereby give you positive minutes. Thank you, John Henry. So yes, you have, you have your time, Rob. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, John Henry. Thank you, Alex. What I would like to focus on this morning is the particular and the individual. So, of course, this week we've been working our way through the transformation of Christ together, and this is a general transformation, something that's applicable to all of us universally considered. And tomorrow we'll have the Universal Call to Holiness panel. And yet, when conversion comes, it comes to the individual. It's a particular conversion. Now, I'm going to speak about St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, more commonly known as Edith Stein. And when she comes to our knowledge first, it's often precisely as a convert, a convert to Catholic Christianity from Judaism, and also a convert from atheism, or at least profound agnosticism. And we come to know her both philosophically in some way and devotionally as a convert. Now, when we look into St. Edith Stein's conversion, many features can be given, many historical facts can be given as a reason for her conversion, like the fact that she read Kierkegaard and the New Testament, and the fact that she came across Max Scheler and through her phenomenological studies encountered other Christians and Catholics of fervor. And yet, when she's asked about her conversion, she repeats words from the book of Isaiah, which in, in the Latin Vulgate is secretum meum mihi, my secret is my own, or my secret to myself. And this seems to put before us again that particularity of conversion. God calls to each of us individually in our conversion, and it's in response to that call that conversion comes about. And yet, we have to try and understand this in such a form, in a general way. We have to think our way through it with some kind of generality. Now, it seems to me that another section of, of Isaiah puts before us 
a generality that speaks to the particularity of each of us as individuals. And that is, I have called you by name, you are mine, from uh, chapter 43 of Isaiah. I have called you by name, you are mine. Now, this seems to me to chart the course of St. Edistein's life. She had, of course, this profound appreciation for the individual, and in her works, as you probably know, she famously disagrees with St. Thomas Aquinas on the principle of individuation. And one of the reasons why she disagrees with Aquinas, or one of the ways she supports her disagreement from Aquinas is a quote from the book of Revelation. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. So there's a sense here in the book of Revelation, as understood by Stein, that each of us have a proper name. And it seems to me this gives us the adequate interpretation of that verse from Isaiah. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Now, Dr. Spencer, earlier in the week, spoke about the fact that all creatures are logoi of the logos. In the beginning was the word, and through the word all things have been made. And there's a certain respect in which all things are words of God words of the word. And of course, we have the book of Genesis, where we find that God speaks things into being. Now, if we think these things together, when he speaks us into being, does he not speak that proper name? A name that is human, but also a name that is each of us. And such that we have each of us a proper name. And this then is his call to us to be what he has spoken. And since to be is to live for a living being, that means to be and to live as oneself. Now, the immediate appeal of this is, for what other reason will God have created than that he wants the creature to be itself? For what other reason has he created the human person than he wants the human person to be him or herself? Why would a carpenter create a table unless he wants the table to be a table? Why would God create unless he wants the creature to be itself? And of course, God calls by speaking. God creates by speaking. And then he calls that which he has spoken into being to himself. And I think we ought to understand conversion according to this template. God is calling to each of us to be ourselves. And in so doing, he's calling us forth to him. And in our response then, when we turn toward him, then we orient our lives with respect to that call. Now, this does seem to authentically chart the course of, of Edith Stein's life. Like Dietrich von Hildebrand, she was an incredibly independent thinker. And what anchors her thought all throughout her life is the question of truth. And in her response to the question of truth, she stood independent first of her Orthodox Jewish faith, the faith of her family, which caused great consternation within her family. And then at a later point, or at the same point, but in a different respect, stood independent of a philosophy that remained pure without any Catholic dogma to render the truth um, already constrained. And so in many respects, she was able to stand outside of those contexts that determined her because she heard the call of truth. And this led to much natural frustration in her life. So on a number of occasions, she habilitated but couldn't be a professor. And then when she enters the Catholic faith and enters the Carmelite convent, much of her philosophy is then disregarded. And yet at the same time, she continues responding to this call. And like what we, we saw last night in The Hidden Life with Franz Jägerstetter, there was much hiddenness about this at the time, and yet this hiddenness was then exposed for us so that we today can speak about her life and learn from her life this responsivity to the call of God. Now, let's try and then think of this from a personal perspective. If these lines of Isaiah are rightly interpreted from the perspective of that line from Revelation, and I think Edith Stein's life brings before us that that is the case, then God really does call to us, each of us individually. There is a general call or a universal call to holiness, 
but it has a kind of defined particularity. And that particularity doesn't stand separate from us. It's not like I'm here and God's direction for my life is over here. Rather, that call is our very selves. And God is calling us forward to him. Now, often when we think about God's thought about us, we think of it as some kind of determining constraint upon human freedom. If God really does have an idea for our lives, then how are we still free? But if we understand the call of, our, of God to us as our very selves, of course that problem d dissolves. There's no antithesis here. God is calling us, and that call is ourselves. There is no competition anymore. God is not competitive with us. We become competitive with him when we stop listening, when we turn away. But when we learn to creatively cooperate, to use some of the terms of von Hildebrandt, um, as put before us yesterday by Dr. Walter, we then have a dissolution of this problem. To be one's authentic self is to be precisely what God wants one to be. And that is to live forward to him according to his call, having come forth from him as a word of his, and then responding to his word through the course of our life, and hopefully returning to him. Now, this may well lead to much natural frustration like St. Edithstein's life, and yet at the same time, if we remain true to that, then it seems to me that the glory of Christ will then resonate in our own lives also. I think I've taken less time, but that's okay. You have, and that is okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rob. Uh, um, I think there's been some questions to hear a particular prayer. Oh, uh. all right. Okay, let's see here. All right. Receive me, O Lord, into thy holy law. Receive me into thy love. Receive me into thyself. For thou hast said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and have appointed you that you should go and bring forth fruit. All my weaknesses, all my defects, all myself, all the darkness in my soul fail to discourage me. I take refuge in thy arms. I throw myself upon thy heart, the desire of the eternal hills. I know that thou receivest those who give themselves to thee holy. I shall live then, live by thee. Even thy true divine life, to which all fullness of natural life is but a dwelling in death, the life of which thou hast said, this is eternal life, that they know thee, the one true God and him that thou hast sent, Jesus Christ. This is the life that I long for, the life which like a stream flows over into eternity, the everlasting, never-ceasing, blissful life which is one with thyself and the never-ending love. Let me not be confounded in my hope. Thou hast never yet disappointed those who put their hope in thee and deliver themselves wholly to thee. For thou alone, in whom is the fullness of divinity, canst fill our hearts to the full. I have heard the psalmist cry out, Taste and see that the Lord is sweet. I hear the voice of thy apostle. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. And thou hast thyself promised those who follow thee that one day they will hear thy voice. Come ye blessed of my Father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uphold me, O Lord, according to your word, and I shall live, and do not let me be confounded in my hope. Thank you. We'll open up the floor for additional questions. In the back. I find uh, this connection between the discovery of realist philosophy and attraction to the Catholic Church fascinating. And I think the linkage there is authority. 
when you acknowledge a realist philosophy, you're saying that your mind has to submit to being and the truth about being. It's not relativistic. It's not like Nietzsche where you just throw out that it's there and try to recreate it in your own image, but you have to submit your mind to the truth about being. And once you do that on the philosophical level, it's, you can't take it as an insult if you submit to the church. If God has spoken, he's spoken with authority. And so, uh, uh, you know, many others in the, in the Munich phenomenology and the realist phenomenologists either converted or were attracted to, or investigated the Catholic Church, and I think there's that clear linkage. And Kierkegaard, though he never got to Catholicism, strongly criticized his Danish state church because they didn't speak with authority. They were more like the, the scribes and, and Pharisees. But, all right, good enough. Would like to reply? Yeah, yeah I, I think that that's that's correct, uh, Michael. Thank you. A, a tendency, I, and this is something that I think comes across very clearly in in the confessions, is to place ourselves in the uh, feet of God to to take His place, and when we submit to truth to the authority of truth, then we stand before him properly as creatures. And that truth can be found in the natural world, from, explored from a perspective of realist phenomenology or realist philosophy more general, and the truth can be found in the magisterium, interpreting the revelation of God, the word of God. And maybe we can think these two things together, the, the book of life and the book of revelation and the book of human history. And if our minds remain true to those books, then we authentically hear the word of God. And if we learn to submit to that word, that's a submission to his authority. And I think this came across very clearly in John Henry's talk. This submission to the authority of truth is not in any way opposed to the independence of the thinker. We really are creative in our thought, even if that thought has its anchor in the truth that is the word of God, in the book of life, in the book of revelation, in the book of, of history. And I, I also think that in Van Hildebrand, the, uh, to the extent that the authority of the church, for example, in, in a certain moment at least, was perhaps perceived briefly as, uh, as intrusive, it was because, um, because he came to realize that there was an element of self-assertion in him. Um, and it's interesting, in, in the, the Soul of a Lion, Alice von Hildebrand links this, uh, this discovery of authority also to the discovery of, of the role of humility as one of the fundamental moral attitudes for the knowledge of truth. So, this, so you, you see the genesis of some of the very ideas that von Hildebrand later teaches in his work. I wanted to add to that. Um, so authority sometimes we think of as sort of power coming down Right, and I think authority is also the idea of a source, right? So being, submitting to being in that sense, I think of Bonaventure's philosophy of the human person and his idea of memoria. Basically, it's the power of human consciousness. And we already have being is already there. Um, God is already, so to speak, touching our soul and drawing us up even before we can describe that as God. So it's not like we're blank and then we like consider things and then we decide whether to submit. It's that we already come from, we're already in being, being's already in us, right? So Rob's point about we, God made us so we can be ourselves, right? Um, I like to, when I think of the kind of apologetic stance of a, a, maybe a skeptic or somebody, I, I want to tell them things like, you already believe in God. You just don't know that's God, right? You already think there's a good, there's a true, there's a beautiful, you think these transcendental values are ready, right? You know, oh, Calicles, you don't believe yourself when you deny those. Uh, like Socrates said to Callicles. Um, but what Bonaventure says here, I just wanted to pull out that thing about memory. Um, it's not the same as we, we think of as memory. In, in the section where he, just before chapter four that I talked about, he says, following Augustine's tradition, enter into yourself therefore and observe that your soul loves itself most fervently. It could not love itself unless it knew itself, nor could it know itself unless it summoned itself to memory. For we do not grasp anything with our understanding unless it is present to our memory. 
when I first read that, I thought, that's interesting, because I think of getting things from memory. But he's talking about bringing things to memory. Right? And what he says in the next part, he says, the function of memory is of the memory or memoria is to retain and represent not only present corporeal and temporal things, but also successive, simple, and everlasting things. It retains the past by remembrance. That's what we think of as memory. But also, as he says, it retains the present by receiving things into itself. That's what we call consciousness. And the future by foresight, we can project into the future all that in one moment. It retains also simple things. And he gives the examples of a point, an instant, and a unit without which it is impossible to bring anything to consciousness, right? It retains them in a permanent way also the principles and axioms of all the sciences. We would think of like logical laws. All that is already structured into our very um, souls. We already have being, we already have the transcendentals there. And then when it comes to intellect, he talks about, right, obviously being itself is there. And thinkers like Aquinas and Scotus say this, this is how we cognize anything. Right? We cognize in a, in a, in a confused manner, we, we, we cognize being, right? Or Scotus said, being is habitually known. Even a fetus, right, habitually knows being, right? It's there before it has to, it doesn't get information that activates something, it was already in there. So I find a great insight that when we submit to being, right, we're being ourselves, we're coming from God and going to God, which is the whole point of conversion in the Christian life. Uh, Mark? I guess my question is primarily for uh, Alex, um, but I guess others can certainly chime in. So you mentioned how um, one of the, the marvelous things about the Franciscan school is how uh, the person of St. Francis himself is a living datum, right? a living source. And I, I think of, you know, like St. Bonaventure's marvelous uh, life of St. Francis, you know, which, which expounds upon his life. And you, and you talked about how this bore such great fruit. I mean, I think we I would contend like the, the whole like Western representational artistic tradition sort of comes out of, out of St. Francis with people like Giotto and, and Fra Angelico and, and people like this. So marvelous fruits of, of this, this personality. And I was wondering if you would be willing to share your sort of witness to us a little more of how in your own life, um, St. Francis has been a living datum for your own thought. I mean, I, I take it you implicitly shared this a bit by sharing the things from Bonaventure, but more about St. Francis himself, right. how he can be a witness to us. Um, the first biography I read of St. Francis was Chesterton's. And so there's a lot of images in that biography, if you haven't read that, that I, I highly encourage you to read. And one of the things he talks about St. Francis in the beginning is being a puzzle to the sort of modern skeptic. Um, because on the one hand, he's extremely ascetical. Right, which to many modern people might seem sort of morbid. Right? But on the other hand, he's like extremely joyful and cheerful, like, like a maniac. Right? And well, what puts those two things together? And what Chesterton says in that first bit is what puts those together, is what explains it all is a lover who's like desperately wants to be with his beloved. He'll do anything, he'll cut off his arm, you know, whatever. So, so that idea of, of love personally being such an animating factor that it can sustain both the like radical asceticism of a true Christian life, right? And also the pure joy of being a created image of God in this beautiful world that he made. So that's the first thing that inspires me. Um, and then the other thing is that um, sort of what Rob was mentioning is the individuality. So St. Francis is obviously an incredible personality of, of complete originality, right? And how did he get that? Well, it's by to use the language that Michael Haley just used, submitting to being, following God, following the call of God. And again, something that Chesterton mentions is that when God calls, sort of like grace knocks but might not knock again, is you respond right away. And so from the outside, it might appear, and Chesterton talks about this with St. Francis, it appeared, he appeared imprudent in certain respects. Right, so from an outside point of view, he's not like properly deliberating things. Right, he sort of rushes into things. Right? But in a certain way, he's just ready to respond to the call. And there's no, there's no debating about that. When you hear it from God, you do it. Right? And if it wasn't the way you're supposed to do it, he'll teach you. So instead of trying, for me, I'm, I'm an academic, so my tendency is to go into abstractions. Right? And so St. Francis is always reminding me that it's about that personal encounter, personal relationship, responding to God in my thoughts. Right? The very insights that, that I feel like I receive when I'm reading beautiful authors, like when you were reading that prayer, right, or different, different moments of your, your talk. There's like an insight or an intuition. I tend to want to attribute those to myself, right? But St. Francis reminds me that those don't come from me. 
Like those insights and intuitions come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in my very thoughts, which is the thing I'm always doing as a philosopher. So he reminds me to sort of recognize the source, the authority, where things are coming from in a personal, constantly remind myself of that personal relationship that I'm in. Whether I think of it that way or not, that's what's happening. Yeah, so. Can I add one thing to that? So that, um, that, all, that all resonates a great deal, though um, my confirmation name is St. Francis, but I was confirmed a little too early, and so I picked him because of his love of animals, not for all of these, these noble reasons. But the, the, what you say reminds me of something that we didn't talk about with regard to Van Hildebrand, and in a way it would be true also of, of certainly true in an extraordinary way of Adit Stein, which is the dimension of witness. And um, that is to say, the, the respect in which the, the transformation wrought in them spilled over into the lives of others and became a, a call and an appeal. Um, ben Hildebrand had um, an extraordinary number of godchildren, which, uh, which I take to be a sign of, <laughs> I mean, I suppose you could have godchildren for the wrong reasons, but it's a lot of people to think about. He had over 100 godchildren um, that he sponsored into the church, people who came to him. He was often, people, were, people often said, you need to go talk to Dr. Van Hildebrand. He'll explain your mysterious experience. People would have these, they'd have a dream or they'd have a troubling experience. They'd go to him. But it seems to me that the, uh, the most striking feature of his, uh, of his Christian witness was his joy. His joy and his, and, and of course, what does joy flow from? It flows from love. Um, and uh, one of his students, uh, who I, th I think later became a convert, said that when meeting him in the classroom, he said, I never realized it was possible for someone to be as happy as he was. So that, so that captures beautifully the, just, the, uh, just the, the abundant joy that he manifested. And there are a number of people in the room here who knew him and can speak to that looking at you, Michael, and Jim, and my dad. Um, but that, that comes through in his, in his writing and in his life. And um, yeah, so I, I think that this, the, we haven't come, he doesn't speak so much about Christian witness in this book, but that, that maybe brings his own Christian thought full circle to bring into, a, into focus the dimension of witness. Rob, anything to add? No. Okay. Next question. question is for Dr. McNamara. Um, it would seem to me that for Stein, um, following uh, St. Thomas, she would, she would say that, that to speak of a moment of, of conversion or to speak of a call is an abstraction. In, in the same way that creation, in a sense, is an abstraction. There's creation, there's conservation. And so the conservation in a sense, is happening every single moment of our lives. The ground of our being is a, a constant giving, constant influx of our existence. So if we take these two ideas of Stein's, um, it is a call. In this case, it would be a constant calling from every single moment of our lives to the next. And, con and, and, and the fact that this call is ourselves, for Stein, does this show up in experience? Can it show up in experience in, in a concealed way for, for everyone, not just the saint? That, that at every moment, there is a constant calling, which is our very true self. I think it's helpful, uh, Mario, how you thought together the, the phenomenology and the metaphysics there. Because, of course, in her later thought, in her mature works, she integrates the phenomenological method of Edmund Husserl with the metaphysical tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas and, and other Christian Catholic thinkers. And so she comes to understand creation in that very way, which is that God's act of creation as the gift of being is something that is a perpetual act and endures throughout the entire course of the creature's existence. Creation as an act becomes conservation. Now, when we think that together with the, the sacred scriptures, and when we think of God as an intelligent and volitional being, we can think of this as an expression of meaning in the word of creation. Genesis speaks about God speaking things into being, and St. John's prologue is, in the beginning was the word through whom all things have been made. And we should take these 
insights of Revelation incredibly seriously. And what, how do we understand this then? Well, God is speaking us into being here and now. If he failed to thoughtfully love and speak us into being, we would immediately cease to be. And what else is he saying then? Then be, be you what I have spoken you. Now, if we begin to try and think about this phenomenologically, surely the creator hasn't hid this word from us. He hasn't made it a paradox or a mystery to be solved. A mystery in the sense of a complex problem that's really difficult to get the bottom of. But of course it is a mystery in, in, a, in a more fulsome sense. It seems to me that surely we can hear his voice in the natural world, in the book of Revelation, in history, and we can hear his voice in ourselves. Now, one of the most interesting panels for me earlier in the week was the, the panel on recollection. Of course, we need a kind of recollected disposition, recollected at attitude to hear that, to hear that call, to hear that voice. Because it's not something that will come booming into our lives every moment, though we will certainly have boom moments, I think, vivid moments. It'll be the, 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 the soft voice that Elijah heard. I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, uh, Rob, you mentioned the, this idea of creative cooperation. Um, and it occurs to me that in, in the book of Genesis, uh, Adam is part of his first thing he does with the creative order is that God invites him into the creative act, that God brings the animals to Adam and Adam names them. Uh, and that there's a, a way in which our, our cooperation with God brings about true creation. We get invited into the creative act. And I think this even shows up in the life of St. Francis, right? There's this abundance of um, this rich Franciscan tradition that follows from him. And I was wondering if there's perhaps more commentary that could be given. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a malformed question of just um, how our, our co cooperation with God brings about uh, our participation in his creative act. It reminds me of uh, an insight in, in Wojtyla's writings where he speaks about creativity as an authentic sign of personal being. Where you find creativity, there you find a person. And he resolves this creativity to thought, to our ability to think. And there's, there's something um, unusual about this because, of course, we've spoken on a number of occasions and a number of ways about the way thought is responsive or receptive to being. And we have to think in truth if we are to think rightly. And yet, nonetheless, in this receptivity to being and in this thinking of truth, there is a kind of creativity. And I think of this creativity as, as a cooperative creativity. God has drawn us into his creativity, and having created us as persons, he introduces us to his, his own creativity. In some way, his creativity encompasses all of that, so there's nothing new under the sun, and yet we really are creative secondary causes. And this comes across very, very strongly in the Thomistic tradition, which Wojtyla is reading here in a phenomenological way. And so, so I think, yeah, I, I think we have to, in hearing the call of God for us, we have to creatively respond. And in some way then, we'll, we'll discover his thought for us in that creative response. And his, his immense causality is such that this in no way um, constrains or reduces our freedom. Can I pick up right there? Yeah. yeah, so I, I think to me, I hear that question, I hear the kind of mystery of freedom. 
what, how, how, does, how does that work? And I found great insights in the, in the Franciscan tradition that I identify myself in. Um, and I think we make mistakes about freedom. On the one hand, we think freedom means the freedom of choices. So we have this or that. And so that's what freedom is. Or we have the idea of freedom means, I, I, or even the word creativity means produce something else, right? Something outside of me. I think th there's freedom there, but that's not the deepest kind of freedom. The deepest kind of freedom is obviously the freedom that is in God himself, right? Freedom is a pure perfection, as Scotus would say, you know, following Anselm through that tradition, the Victorine school into Bonaventure and into himself, right? Um, so that idea of a pure perfection is something that we see as a perfection in us, right? But we can imagine sort of... Um, taking away the imperfections of it and then, and then sort of multiplying it to infinity and giving it to God, right? So that's a pure perfection roughly. Um, so God has freedom. God doesn't only have freedom because he makes, creates, right? But he has freedom ad intra in his very Trinitarian life, there's freedom. So what kind of freedom is that, right? Obviously that's kind of a freedom that is consistent with necessity. So God necessarily loves himself freely. What is that? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Right? God is, you might say God the Father, following the Augustinian tradition, is God sort of accepting, or not accepting, God um, being present to the God self. Right? That's the Father, unbegotten. And then there's God thinking of God, the God self. That's the Son. That's the begetting the Son, the intellectual sort of act in, in the Godhead. And then there's the will, God accepting the Godhead. Right? That's the Holy Spirit. So it's an accepting will. Right, a receiving will, you might say. He accepts his own identity eternally, right? And that's free. Well, how can that be free if necessary? Well, because freedom in the Franciscan tradition means aseitas. It means self-determination. The, the principle, right, is in, is in God, right? He's not free because, right, there's an object here and he chooses that object, right? He's free because he determines himself to be free, and so do we. So we can be free with respect to necessary goods, and we can be free with respect to contingent goods. And so one of, obviously, one of our necessary goods is us being ourselves, right? Um, but that's also compatible with contingent goods, the things we pursue in our lives creatively, the, 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 the occupations we go on, the actions, the pursuits, the talents, etc. So I find the great mystery of creativity and participation in God and conversion metaphysically to be in the doctrine of the person and especially the will. Right, how that how that works in the dynamic freedom, right? That we need to do. We can imitate God. So God has a freedom, and we can imitate that. And that is a participation in His very form and mode of willing. That is to be divinized, right? That is to be hierarchized, right? To have that very same sort of freedom through grace. So that's how I would sort of go with that answer. Christopher, I'd, I'd like to take my two minutes back. Yes, <clears throat> they're still yours, with interest, even if you'd like a little more. Wojtyla has this phrase that we have to pause at the irreducible of subjectivity. And in this phrase, he captures the modern tradition and places it in the metaphysical tradition of Catholic Christianity and, and shows the import of the modern tradition and the focus on the subject. We need to pause at the irreducible of subjectivity. And it seems this week, with our focus on conversion, we need to pause at that phrase from Isaiah, Secretum meim mihi, my secret is my own. Here is, here is the heart of conversion. Uh, St. John Henry Newman used this phrase, St. Philip Neri used this phrase, St. Edith Stein uses this phrase, and it, it captures something authentic of the center of conversion. It's universal in the sense that if we convert, we all experience that, and yet it's particular to the individual. And I think we need to pause there in our reflections on our transformation in Christ. No more questions. We will pause there. I think that is a very, very fitting ending. Um, and after this is mass. So um, we have time. Uh, the mass is in just over 15 minutes. We'll resume this afternoon uh, at 2. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning.